O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's Church on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. We are grateful to everyone who has contributed to and has participated in this service. At a meeting of the session of St. Andrew's on Tuesday evening, it was decided to suspend our gathered services until at least October 18th, after which a further assessment will be made. We have enjoyed the four trial services that have been held and we are grateful to all who participated and contributed feedback on how we can make worship as safe as possible in this time of COVID-19. However, with the rapid rise of cases in Toronto and across the province and the country, the session decided that it was important and prudent to not put people at any unnecessary risk and to once again suspend our services in the sanctuary until an improvement is seen. We will continue our online services and we encourage you to join us regularly 
and to invite others to be part of this experience of worship. We also encourage you to take note of the announcements at the end of the service and also to look at the website at standrewstoronto.org to find other ways you can be involved in the life and ministry of St. Andrews at this time. Stay tuned after the service today for Shara's challenge when she will be giving some instructions on making bread that we can use in next week's World Communion Sunday. May you be blessed in this time of worship. Let us pray. God of steadfast love and mercy, as the seasons change, we see that you are still at work in the world, transforming hearts and communities. We praise you for all you do to repair injustice, bringing peace to places of hostility, working for goodness to prevail among neighbors and nations. You have shown us the true face of power in Jesus Christ reaching out with healing and hope to touch desperate lives. Help us to see the face of Jesus in this time of worship and fill us with renewed energy and insight in this autumn season so that we can join in your work to bring justice and joy into the world you love. Friends, let us together confess our sins against God and against our neighbors trusting in the promise of forgiveness. Almighty God, we have been wandering in the wilderness of sin. We have complained in the face of your mercy. We have been selfish and conceited in the face of your sacrifice. We have not done your will. Forgive us, we pray. Hear these words of assurance. Our sins are forgiven. The Lord is loving and we are reconciled to God. Therefore, let us humble and surrender ourselves to the will of God. Gracious God, we thank you for being ever present with us. We know that we are never alone. Your mercies have been faithful and rich. Teach us humility. Teach us gratitude. Infuse your spirit into our beings so that we might be reconciled to you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today's readings are drawn from those suggested by the lectionary for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and continue in our reflections on narratives that we have been following for the last few weeks. Our reading from Exodus tells the story of the Israelites who have now begun their wilderness sojourn and, are, and find themselves in a time of great uncertainty, great anxiety, even great fear because of their lack of water. Our reading from the Gospel of Matthew tells the story of Jesus' interactions with some of the religious officials of his day, but then he uses a, a parable about two people, two brothers, called to go into a vineyard, one who refuses to do so but then goes, and one who agrees to do so but does not end up fulfilling his part of the arrangement. Our reflections are invited on what it means to live by our faith and to act on that which we say we claim to believe. Our reading from the Psalms, which will be sung by the choir as a paraphrase, is drawn from Psalm 78 and invites us to tell to each generation the wondrous stories, the wondrous narratives, the wondrous accounts of God's faithfulness to us and to the world. Let us listen for God's ancient word to us 
and realize in it the profound and relevant truths that it conveys to us even today. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man has two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors 
and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for those of you who are counting, this past week marks six months since the COVID-19 closures began in Ontario. On March the 17th, the province of Ontario announced the closure of schools and the church suspended regular worship services just over a week later. Since then, we have all lived through challenging times. Six months of uncertainties, struggles, difficulties. Six months of wondering how to keep going, what the proper steps to take are, what safety measures we need to embrace every time we step out the door, what needs to be done to ensure a safe and healthy return to a more regular and normal life, whatever regular and normal ultimately turn out to look like. To say that it's been a disruptive and disorienting time is a profound understatement. And all of us have, from time to time, likely given in to a bit of frustration, a bit of grumbling, a bit of complaining. We know that we should be grateful for the many blessings that we have, but sometimes it's a challenge to focus on the good in light of the uncertainties that face us on a daily, if not an hourly basis. To watch kids go back to school over the past couple of weeks, to wonder about elderly parents and grandparents, to wrestle together with whether or not to go back to work or continue to meet in person or as families or as friends or as church communities. It's not been an easy time. When I turned to read the suggested passages for this particular Sunday in the church year, I was intrigued to realize that this is actually the second time this year that the lectionary invites us to read the story of Israel grumbling in the wilderness. This is very unusual. The, lect the lectionary typically cycles through large and varied portions of scripture over a three-year basis. But this year, today's reading from Exodus 17 was also used on March the 15th, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, which was one of the last public worship services that was held at St. Andrews before the closures began. As such, I thought it can be interesting to ponder how this passage meets us now, now that we are well into the journey of this strange time. As we do so, it's important for us to be careful in how we read and interpret biblical passages, and particularly where we find ourselves, or perhaps more accurately, where we place ourselves interpretively in the story. It can be complicated, for example, to align ourselves closely with the newly liberated Israelites in this passage, since very few, if any of us, have actually been enslaved as the Israelites had been in Egypt. But the reason why these stories were told and retold even long after the Israelites were a free and independent people was specifically because there were profound and important lessons that they realized that they had learned and in some cases been forced to learn during their time in the wilderness. And those lessons from the wilderness are lessons that we do well to continue to ponder even today. So what were the dynamics at work in this story, regardless of whether we can completely understand the newly liberated Israelites' experience? And what lessons do they set before us for the living of our faith today? First and foremost, it's important to realize that the Israelites were honestly and legitimately worn out. They had been promised great things by Moses and Miriam and Aaron. Follow us and we will lead you out of bondage into a land flowing with milk and honey, they had said. Follow us and you will know freedom and security, they had said. Follow us and your enslavement and suffering will be over. You will know stability and liberty. You will know the blessings of God, the establishment of a lasting community, the gift of a promised land, the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham and Sarah so long ago. And they had done what Moses and Aaron and Miriam had asked them to do. They had followed the advice, as strange as it was. 
They'd done really strange things like smearing the blood of lambs on their doorposts in Egypt, packing up their belongings, leaving some of their things behind and heading out into the wilderness. To be sure, they had seen strange things along the way. The plagues in Egypt had been strange enough, but they had also seen the waters of the Red Sea part that eaten manna and quail provided for them in the wilderness. They had followed Moses and Aaron and Miriam as they had been invited to do. But to what end? To a seemingly pointless wandering in a dry and arid wilderness with no end to their journey in sight, no way back to what they had once known, a lack of confidence that their leaders had any great vision or insight to offer them, and challenges that had the potential to affect their very survival. I'll repeat that short description of the situation that the ancient Israelites were in. No end to the journey in sight. No way to go back to what they had once known. A lack of confidence that their leaders had any great vision or insight to offer them. And challenges that had the potential to affect their very survival. Ah, these old stories that have no relevance to life in the modern world, eh? So how did that bedraggled, worn-out group of wanderers in the wilderness react to their circumstances? Well, they grumbled. They complained. They expressed their frustrations. They blamed their leaders. As we read in chapter 17, verse 3, the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? Moses was equally exasperated and redirected the people's frustrations to God. What am I to do with these people, we read? They're almost ready to stone me. Well, God came through for him, as God so often had done for the people already. Moses was told to go out before the people to take his staff and strike the rock at Horeb and water would come gushing out, which he did. The people's thirsts were quenched, their lives were saved, all of which was good and important. But most important of all, the people were reminded yet again that, that the one who called them, the God who had guided them, the God who had cared for them so well in the past, could actually still be trusted, even in spite of the challenges that were confronting them in that wilderness. God could be trusted. An important dimension of the wilderness experience was this call to learn again and again that trust in God was to be the foundation of their life as individuals and their life as a community of people. And this is why this story was first told, and why it has been told and retold across cultures and generations and millennia. It's not a story about geological formations which might or might not produce water if hit at a correct angle with a stick. Nor is it a story about the effectiveness of grumbling and complaining in difficult times as if that is all that is necessary to change the mind of God. Rather, it's a story about learning to trust again learning to trust in God when trust in God is all that they really had to go on. It's a story about the God who is trustworthy and whose power was not limited nor confined to the seeming challenges in which they found themselves. This is a story that was told and retold to remind all who would hear it and read it that the journey can be long and tiring, that there are times when uncertainties and threats seem overwhelming, but that even in those moments, God is present. God is worthy of trust. God has the power to provide what is needed when we need it, in spite of any seeming evidence to the contrary. But this story is not just about our own individual faith, although it is about that. It is not just about our own individual ability to trust in God in life's difficult moments. Rather, this is also the story about a community of people. The biblical commentator Michael Chan has written about this passage, and I quote, We should note that the Israelites are not only on a journey through the wilderness, they are also on a journey of the soul, being transformed from an earlier existence as an enslaved people to that of an independent nation. 
Few would disagree that one of the Bible's most difficult commands is the call to trust. This is especially true when the world teaches you that your survival depends upon distrust and skepticism. These wilderness stories demonstrate just how difficult it would be to transform a formerly enslaved people into a trusting nation. And what is said about the ancient people of Israel can equally be said of the challenge of being the church even today. What does it mean in the midst of challenge and uncertainty to embrace such moments as opportunities to grow and deepen our trust that the God who promised never to leave us or abandon us is still present, still caring, still loving, and still powerful? We are six months in. There's no end to this journey in sight. There's no way to go back to once what we once knew. There is not a great deal of confidence that our leaders have any great vision or insight to offer to solve our present difficulties. They need our prayers more than anything. And there are challenges that have the potential to affect our very survival. And so the question that we are invited to ponder is the same question that was placed before those ancient people of Israel. What does it mean to set aside the complaints, the grumbling, the fear, the uncertainty, and to learn to replace all of those negative emotions with a deepened sense of trust in the God who is, the God who loves, the God whose power we claim is at work among us and is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, this God who alone is worthy of our trust. To be honest, I don't really know how to let go entirely of the frustrations and the grumbling. These days, like all of you, I'm sure, I have moments when the uncertainties seem overwhelming. And in the story from Exodus, I would be voicing my displeasure right alongside those thirsty, wandering Israelites. I have moments when I can grumble and complain every bit as much as our ancient ancestors in the wilderness did. But maybe it's in those moments, moments of frustration, moments of fear, moments of complaining, that we, it is good to remember that there is another voice that calls to us, a voice that calls to us in our moments of feeling most worn out and weary, our moments of feeling overwhelmed and afraid, our moments of not knowing what the future looks like, and not entirely sure even where we are anymore. And that voice comes to us, even now, with a simple yet a transforming invitation. It is this, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And to that all we can say, is thanks be to God, and amen. Let us affirm our faith in these words from the Iona community. With the whole church, we affirm that we are made in God's image, befriended by Christ, empowered by the Spirit. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all creation, we celebrate the miracle and the wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God, forever at work in ourselves and the world. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. God of our past and our future, God of healing and hope, we come before you with grateful hearts trusting that you walk with us through every situation. Today we pray for those who are facing danger and despair in these times, those living with hunger that never ends, those facing daily unrest and violence, those challenged by the coronavirus pandemic and measures to control it, and all those anxious about their future. We pray for those who work to relieve suffering and those working to bring peace and justice. Bless them all with your courage. 
We pray for all those wrestling with sorrow or discouragement in any area of their lives, for those living with illness or pain, for those who are in hospital, for those bearing chronic conditions or disability, for those who know the grief and change of bereavement. We especially remember the Weiss family today. We pray for all those who work to bring healing and comfort and agencies which offer support and care in our community. Bless them all with your compassion. We pray for all who feel helpless or hopeless in this present time, for those facing unemployment, struggling to make ends meet, for those caught up in the pain of misunderstanding or broken relationships, for any working through situations of conflict at home or at work. We pray for all who offer guidance and support to face these challenges, for those who lend skills in reconciliation or mediation. Bless all these with your wisdom and patience. God of our past and our future, God of healing and hope, we pray for the ministries of the Presbyterian Church in Canada and for national and international staff members who represent Christ in our name during such challenging times. We pray for our own congregation of St. Andrews and the other congregations and ministries of our presbytery and synod, for ministers, elders, and other leaders who seek wisdom for decision-making. Help all of us engage each day with faithfulness. Guide us, encourage us, and inspire us to meet the challenges before us, and give us the commitment to keep following Jesus. For we pray all our prayers in his name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go and do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God in all that you do. And may the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the comfort and friendship of God's Holy Spirit bless you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Hi there, everyone. I hope you're staying safe and healthy in this time of COVID. I'd like to invite you to take part in this year's Scotia Bank Charity Challenge to raise money for St. Andrew's Community Services. This year has transformed our lives in the most unexpected of ways, and the Scotia event is no different. It's being held as a virtual race. What is that, you might ask? Well, it isn't sitting at home, staring at an animated walking figure on your computer screen. It simply means that you register online and participate at your own pace throughout the month of October. You can pick your own route and time to walk or run 5K, 10K, a half marathon, or full marathon. You even have the flexibility of spreading out your distance for time over several days, such as walking one kilometer a day for five days. What could be easier than that? Despite the pandemic wreaking havoc on social gatherings, we on the St. Andrew Scotia team will do the 5K walk together as a group on Sunday, October 18th. We will start from St. Andrews, walk a planned route around the downtown area, and end up back at St. Andrews in time for a celebratory morning reception with coffee and treats. I've been participating in the St. Andrews Scotia event every year since it started five years ago because it's a fun and healthy way to raise money for our wonderful programs, especially out of the cold which this year is needed more than ever to feed those living rough on our streets. Our funds also support the Better English Cafe, which helps newcomers to Canada practice their English, as well as our other communal and life-affirming programs, such as Music at St. Andrews and the Heart of the Speaker series. Together, we really can make a difference in this extremely challenging year. Please do join or support us in whatever way you can. Thank you, 
and hope to see you on October 18th. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating World Communion Sunday. So here's a challenge. Last year at church school, the children learned that there are many kinds of bread all around the world. So I asked my mom for my grandma's recipe. My grandma had a Spanish background and she was born in Bolivia, South America. First step, mix um, the yeast, sugar, and warm water in a cup and let the yeast rise. Take a bowl and pour the flour. Then pour the oil. Finally, add some salt. Mix these three ingredients. Add the warm water little by little to make the dough. Okay, after making a big mess in my kitchen, it's finally done. I mix all the ingredients and now my mom told me to cover it and wait. While I wait, I'm listening to some music that reminds me of my grandma and mom. Once the dough is ready, make some little balls. Put the balls on a tray and try to flatten the dough in the shape of a disc. Wow, it looks so good, yummy. Well, the bread is ready. I'll have some coffee with it. Just a quick note. Remember, in the Bible, a scripture says that Jesus is the bread of life. I hope you take upon this challenge and meditate what is World Communion Sunday, why we celebrate it, and also probably have a good excuse to call mom or grandma or auntie or a friend for a good recipe. I hope you are all doing well. Bye for now.